Anyway, so here's the name of it, okay? It's as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. You see, if you think about it, way back to the beginning when Adam and Eve were in the garden and they were right doing all the things God would visit with them, then it came time where God says, don't you eat of the tree that's in the midst of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I'm going to remember the story. We've covered it quite a bit, but it, it really plays out. And then we see that the serpent was more subtle than all the other creatures that ever existed because he was a divine fallen angel. But he came in, and what he did, and I'm just going to make it simple, is he showed Adam and Eve an alternative rather than what God told them. God said, don't eat the tree. Because the moment you eat the tree, your mind's going to be open and Satan's going to crawl in there. <laughs> he didn't quite say it like that. But he says, your eyes are going to be open and you're going to know good and evil. Not God's good, human good and human evil. We can see through our history that there's been a lot of good people that either known about God or have God in their heart that did great things. And people right now that are doing it. But we know that there's been some really evil human beings in the earth. And I talked a little bit about like Genghis Khan. You get a chance to read the history on him. He cut people in half, sliding them down a razor blade. I mean, he was just hideously evil. And so what we don't know is we've been kind of hidden by the scenario of our history. Some history is good. Some history is made up. Remember, history is written by the winner. <laughs> Hello? And if the winner is evil, then his history is going to be different than everybody else looking at the history, you see? That's why we don't put our eyes on the world, right? Because the world is doing what? It's passing away. It will offer false hope. It will say, ah, it's going to get better. But we still don't put our eyes on it. Because it's a created thing. God says you don't serve the created thing more than the creator, which is blessed forever. You just don't do it. So many people today, because of the enemy's suggestions, will try to get great joy and fulfillment out of the toys they buy. <clears throat> you see it in the back of the bumper. It says, I win because I have the most toys, you know. But you know, that's not what life is all about, is it? In fact, the life down here is very limited. But if we have God in our heart, then God influences our thinking. Now, how many know that your thinking could be stinking? You could have bad thoughts. You could have negative thoughts. Maybe you heard, let me show you how it works. Maybe you heard a rumor about Scott. Scott, I'm making this totally up. You heard a rumor about somebody. I, I've always liked to pick on Scott. He's just a blessing. Anyway, you heard a rumor about somebody, but you never met that person. And that person's saying, I want to tell you about this person. Oh, they're a good person, but they have this hang up and they have this hang up and they do. And you know, everything like that. So when you get a chance, they're going to be coming today. When you meet them, just, you know, do your thing and forget what I said to you. What's wrong with that? That's how the devil works. He tries to reason with your mind to get you to look or formulate an opinion of something that's not the truth. And that's what he's been doing ever since the fall of Adam and Eve. He's been assimilating and he's been lying and he's been changing and altering reality. Now you might say, well, I still see there's ground. I still see there's sky. I know, but the reality that he's messing with is the world system, not the earth, the world system. The system is designed like a carrot to lead you astray. It's an alternative of information to paint the wrong picture in your mind so that your thinking is not correct. When our thinking is not correct, then our speaking is not correct. When our thinking is not correct, then our actions are not going to be correct. So God stepped in and he gave us his word. Can you say amen? So that we can find out how God thinks, why God does, and who God is. Can you say amen? 
Therefore, Satan cannot lie to you about God. That's why we get in the word. So you don't become deceived like those people down the end of the street who don't even believe that Jesus rose from the dead. That means they have no salvation. Good people. Wonderful people. But they don't have a salvation because if you don't believe Jesus died and rose again, we have no hope. Without the resurrection of Jesus, you have no hope. You're going to hell. And so that's the reality. But thank God, God stepped in, gave us his son, said, now you get aboard, you receive my son, and then I'm going to show you the way it really is. So then when you look at somebody, you won't prejudge them. When you look at something, you won't formulate an opinion that is not quite correct. And if you look at the situations of the world, you'll get my perspective on it. I want God's perspective, don't you? I want to know how God feels about it, how God sees it. And God says, I'm going to take you right on in. I'm going to show you things to come. Now, the thing that I learned quite some time ago, but I didn't know when I first got saved is that time with God is crucial. Just like your sleep is crucial, you need to have enough sleep so that your mind functions properly, that you can operate, function, you're healthy. Amen? Well, our time with God is very crucial because without the time of God, we're not going to understand God's heart about matters. We're going to still operate on how we think about things. And if we're operating on how we think about things, and if it's the wrong way to think about them, then we're going to react improperly. And we don't mean to. We're just acting on what we understand to be the truth. So God stepped in and gave us his word. Can you say amen? So the way we think, the way we act, we should get it from the word of God. We should line up everything we do with the word of God. Now we're going to find that we fall short. We don't quite line up all the time. But that's where Jesus comes in and he helps us. Amen. Somebody comes in, lays a trip on you, line it up with the word of God. And I can tell them that's not right. Line things up with the word of God. So we have a predicament though. Many Christians today don't have enough word in them to understand who God really is. So let's get the word in you. Let's get a description of Jesus Christ. The reason the father sent his son to die for us, not only to redeem us from our sin, so that we would get a picture of who the father was by looking at Jesus. Didn't Jesus say to Philip, he that has seen me has seen the father. So what do we do as Christians? We study the Old Testament, which avoids talking about God, Jesus, a lot. We go everywhere where we're, instead of getting right there, sitting next to Jesus in our studies. You need to get right into the word, sit next to Jesus, and find out how he responds. And the book for that is John, St. John. In that particular book, Jesus is the king of kings and the answer to everything. You have four Gospels. You have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Each one is a perspective from the personality who writes it. So from Matthew's perspective, you've got a tax collector that's talking about the soon coming king. The lion of the tribe of Judah. So if you look at the attitude and the picture in which Matthew writes the Gospel, he writes it as Jesus the conquering king. Can you say amen? And then when you get to Mark, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Mark depicts Jesus in the same way, but as an ox. What do you mean? As a worker. He's a servant. Jesus is in Mark, a servant. In Matthew, he's a soon and coming king. Over in Luke, he's the son of man. Over in John, he is the mighty God, the coming conqueror. So I always tell new Christians, get into the book of John, watch everything Jesus says, everything Jesus does, because that's your model, that's your cornerstone to model your life after. Can you say amen, somebody? And so if you haven't mastered the book of John, then you need to get in there and find out a little bit more 
who Jesus is so you can befriend him better. Say amen, somebody. It's good stuff. So good morning, church. It's good to be alive in Christ, isn't it? How many years discovering God keeps his word to you? Amen. I like to see those hands. It's great. See, we are meeting in God's house. This is just a building, right? God's house. So I got a little thing. You can use it if you want to use it. This is God's house, but you're sitting in his living room. Hello. And if you can imagine me not being here, but Jesus is going to give you his word today. If you can imagine it like that, you'll get the Holy Spirit really showing you all kinds of things. Because you're coming eager to learn and to hunger after righteousness. Many Christians just come because of the fellowship. But when the bottom line hits, you need to act, be able to act on the word and say the right things, do the right things, right? All right, you still with me? All right, so welcome to our briefing, huh? Today we're going to cover what God says about how we think. And the way we look at and see other things, do we see them from God's perspective or do we see them from our own perspective? We always see things, now listen carefully, in the light of how we understand them. That's why Paul said that the eyes of our understanding would become enlightened, would expand our thinking the way God wants us to. So when we look at something, we can see from God's perspective. So I try to tell people, when I look at you, I don't see your outward man or your outward person. I see God in you and the potential that he has with you. Each one of you are very precious and you have only one position in, in God. Nobody else could take your place. That's why when you, you, you do your own thing and follow your own thing, your whole life is a void now because God has something really special for every human being to fulfill it, make life better, and other people to get saved. But when we don't do that and follow our own thinking and, and do our own thing, it's like a void. And people, you know... They just like walking around. I just really don't know. Okay, so raw, so raw. Whatever will be, will be. The devil's going to make you see the wrong things. He's going to have you look at the problem. Remember, you are like a, like, a, like a Polaroid camera. Folks, if we're concentrating on what's wrong with us, what's wrong with that? We become what's wrong with us conscious. If we focus on the problems of the world, we become problem conscious. Do you understand? Because we're made that way. If you look at calculus, calculus all day, you're going to sleep with numbers. You understand? We're made that way. So God wants to step into our midst and help us to think the way he thinks so that when things don't operate right out here, you have his wisdom and understanding to begin to work in that situation to bring it into a right situation by prayer or by counsel or by whatever. You can look at a situation and say, that's not right. God, I need your wisdom. So that's what this sermon's all about. Your gifts, your talents, God's wisdom working through you. Say amen. So that's why God gave you and I his word. So that we could see it from his perspective. Go with me to John chapter 16, please. John 16, verse 13 through 16. Talking about when the Holy Spirit came. Let me ask you, when did the Holy Spirit come like never before? What day was that? The day of Pentecost. Amen. And when that day came, the church age was born. The church was born. The Spirit of God entered the atmosphere as the glory or the water covers the seas. The glory filled the atmosphere. You and I drink and breathe. You know, we have songs breathing them in and breathing them out. But our brain has to come to the understanding of we walk, we talk, and we move in God. How many ever had a, um, I love this illustration. I hope you can get this. How many ever had a, um, an aquarium? 
little fishies and all that kind of stuff. Maybe a little one, maybe a bigger one. I had one in my office in my other church that was so big, if it ever broke, it'd be a flood, I'd drown. I mean, it was like 50 gallons. It's a huge thing, you know, it was part of the, my office. Somebody bought for me. Anyway, besides all that, you are like that fish. What do you mean? No, you don't have gills. <laughs> You're swimming around in God, if you think about it. Because what did God do at Pentecost? He came into the atmosphere, didn't he? And see, most Christians don't see it the way God wants us to see it. They just see it religiously. Religion is a real opiate of the people. It'll make you feel like you're saved, but you're not getting anywhere. We want you to walk with God so he can get you where you need to go. And he can take you where you need to be. Can you say amen? But you got to trust him. You got to love him. You got to befriend him. And that takes a period of time. So you and I move in God, don't we? Do you believe that? Let me see the hands of those who believe in your. So imagine yourself in, a, in an aquarium. You got up in God. You went to the bathroom in God. You went to the, whatever. You're all moving around in God. So if you're moving around in God, what's the devil doing? He's trying to mess you up thinking you're not really there. You're over here. But you are actually in two places at once. The Bible says, are you ready for this? The Bible says you're seated with Christ in heavenly places right now. And you're seated right here in CCM on the chair of the pew. Right now. Where's the devil? He's confused. He's frustrated. He's got to get your attention with something today so he can harass you. Hello? And so knowing that, knowing that we move in God, we talk in God, we flow in God, then we want to let God give us his wisdom and his understanding so that as a, we think, we can respond the way God would rather us respond. Now, how many's ever ever been to the doctor and he gave you medicine don't raise your hand on this and he says now I want you to take three uh, three of these a day you know every day till they're gone whatever they are amen so the doctor calls you in a few days and says how are you reacting to how you're responding to the medicine what I didn't I haven't taken it yet <laughs> so you know that's silly you know that if you take the medicine and your body reacts to it. Is that a good thing? No. Satan wants to give you his words. Hoping you're going to react to it. So he can mess with your mind. But instead you're going to take God's word. Did you know God's word says. That God's word is medicine. To all your flesh. So you're sick. Your body's having a problem. Get in the word. Dig out scriptures on healing. And as you take it in, the Holy Spirit will mix it up. And healing and medicine will spread through your life. But if you don't do that, you see an area that you're miss messing up or an area that you're lacking. And you don't dig out scripture which gives you the answer for that. Then what's going to happen is you'll suffer that situation over and over due to repeat it until you get that medicine in you. That medicine is the word of God. So you get the right perspective on how God wants you to respond to that. So if you take medicine and you have a reaction, that's not good. That's what Satan wants you to do. React to the world. But if you take God's medicine, the word, you should have response. Your body should respond to the medicine. Can you say amen? And so, therefore, you want to be getting better. You don't want to be the same old snaggletooth you were a week ago. Right, Mike? <laughs> amen. Amen. He's thinking about, well, you're faithful. Amen. So, anyway, the idea behind it is, is we come to church to get our medicine. We come to church to be encouraged. We come to church, all this. But the main thing is to get a new perspective on how to think about where we are in time and where we are with God. Can you say amen? 
Self-analyzation is what causes revival in your life. Sitting down with God and saying, Lord, work on me. Correct me. Change me, Lord. When's the last time you sit down and said, God, how am I doing, by the way? And there's a quietness in heaven for a space of a half an hour. <laughs> do, do, do ask him, Lord, show me the areas that I need work on. I know when you show me, it'll be beautiful and you'll give me the power to overcome that area. See, Satan doesn't want you to know any of this. He wants to let you know that tomorrow might bring a problem. Tomorrow might bring a solution. Whatever tomorrow might bring. And that's the way Christians or non-Christians have been living all their life. Say, not me. You're in John 16, verse 13 says, However, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, that's the Holy Spirit, he will guide you, say me. He will guide you, say me into all truth. How much truth? You want to know about something? He'll guide you right into knowing about it. Now, I want to tell you, if you say something silly like this, God, I want to know more about patience. I'll recommend don't do that. Because the Holy Spirit then has to take you and show you how it works. You want to learn about the power of God? Sit down with God and let the Holy Spirit show you how to work. Everything I've learned was taught mostly by the Holy Spirit. My pastor taught me on basics. But most of it was getting with God, doing what God said. Amazing things. Let me just tell you a couple of them. One time God says, get in the car. I want to take you on a journey. Oh, hallelujah. Now this is when I was young and my brain wasn't hindering you know, I was just a believer, you know, I believed. So we got in the car, me and my other friend, we got in the car and he guided us down through Des Moines. And down in Des Moines years ago, I don't know if you remember, they used to have what we call head shops. You know what a head shop is? <laughs> you know, head shops and all that kind of thing. And uh, my cousin Bruce and a re really wonderful man named Gary Keller, who's gone on to be with the Lord now. Uh, we, were, we drove down there by the leading of the spirit down in Des Moines where I was raised. And sure enough, I got the boldness on me. I said, let's stop right there and take authority over this head shop. Amen. So we drove right up. We got Gary Carroll in the back seat. He's praying in the spirit. I got Bruce and myself. We go in. Now, these guys are dressed in hooded black. I mean, that's a witch's coven. You know, why are you dressed with a hooded, hooded black in the middle of a hot afternoon selling pipes and stuff? You're in the wrong God, buddy. So we walked in. And of course, at this time, I had not a lick of sense. I looked at him and he says, can I help you? I says, no, I'm here to help you. I think you need to be adventurized. You need to get out of your little mundanes and ask God to give you some adventure every day. Okay. And so there was a guy standing next to this guy. He's this big guy was tall. He was about six, three. And this little guy looked like Mike Warnke. And he was a little short guy. He looked at me and says, oh my God, Christians. And he ran out the front door past Gary Keller. Go, ah, just freaking out like that. I love things like, I wish I could have seen that. But then the guy, the big guy, he was coming after me. While Bruce, he was praying over all the little pipes and everything in there. And the big guy was looking at me and says, you know what I could do to you? And I said, what can you do to me? I said, I'll tell you what, you can't do anything besides you feel right now very sick because God's judgment hand is upon you. And you better get, and he went, ah! <laughs> and he ran downstairs and out the back. We had the whole shop to ourselves. So what did we do? We anointed everything. You might say, well, how does that do? Well, sometimes the way we look at things, we look at things sometimes limited by, by our situation. But you see, God knows everything. That was um, one of many, I say 30 journeys that we made in the car at different things, different places. I went to a place where I was raised and God had us get out of the car with four other witnesses. We prayed over the property. We raised our hands. We asked God to sanctify the property. The wind picked up. God to sanctify it. And guess what? It wasn't six months later. Casey Treat broke his ground for his first church. Right there. 
I don't know. God needs volunteers. People that are excited to do things for him. Can you say amen? But we have to have the right thinking. You know, if you think you can't, you can't. Well, I don't know if I, don't know if I could do that. Well, of course. So I'm not talking about a magic way of thinking. I'm talking about... Our thinking influences our speaking, and our speaking influences our doing. And if we got stinking thinking, our life is going to be just like that. So we need to renew our mind. Can you say amen? All right, back to, back to John. All right, so verse 16, uh, I mean... Chapter 16, verse 13. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority. I am the Holy Spirit. No. He speak, but whatever he hears from God, that will he speak. And he will tell you things to come. Sit down with him. He will glorify me, and he will take what is mine and declare it unto you. The word declare means you'll see it 3D. God wants you to know. But he's not going to tell somebody and isn't going to do anything with it. Okay, go on. And then it says, therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it unto you. A couple of points I want to give you. Number one, we now have the Holy Spirit to guide us into all the truth. If you're not understanding something, go to God about it. The Holy Spirit will show you what's coming. Okay? And what your part is in the coming. He showed me that I would actually go through something. I didn't know what it was. But he had me all arranged and everything. That when I lost all this in my life. I was already prepared for it. And he will do the same thing for you. There's nothing that will surprise you. Because you won't be taken unaware. Because God lives in you. Doesn't he? Wow, if God lives in you, then sit down and talk with him like he, uh, give him the credit he needs. Secondly, the Holy Spirit's job is to paint the right mental pictures of how things really are. And to train us how to respond in those such times. Thirdly, studying scripture with the Holy Spirit will renew our minds to the right concepts as... God's way of having us think. This allows us to act right and to speak right. And fourthly, remember we are a spirit being. We have a soul and we live in a body, an earth suit. We must be influenced by the wisdom of God in our spirit, not by what we feel from our flesh. Say amen, somebody. Go with me to Romans chapter 12. We become transformed by what we dwell on. You see the Bible says that if we study the word. We'll be transformed into the image of Christ. But if we study the world. And we hang out in the world. We'll become that kind of creature. Don't know of ups up and downs down. Hello. Are you with me? Romans 12 look at verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, God's merciful, that you present your body a living sacrifice. I showed you that last week. You present your body. There's two people he's talking about there. You and your body. Look at your neighbor and say, you and your bod. <laughs> You're to take your bod, which collects dust, dirt, Besides bathing in it and everything, you are in your prayer life daily supposed to lay it down on the altar and let God zap it. So that it doesn't fight you through the day. How many of you ever had a day where you felt everything clumsy was happening to you? Don't raise your hand. That's a buffeting spirit that does that. I mean, there's one thing that, you know, be clumsy in a couple of things. But it's one thing to be clumsy all day. That's a, unnatural. Take authority over things like that. You're not clumsy. You're blessed. You're graced. So it says, look at this. You present your body a living sacrifice acceptable to God. 
God can't accept your flesh unless you present it to him and he can zap it. When you, which is your reasonable service, you got the word reasonable there, maybe you have another translation. It means you're responsible for putting your flesh down. This is your responsibility to lay down your flesh. Because if you don't, you're going to cause a problem and not mean to. How often have you said the wrong thing to the wrong person? Didn't mean to. All right, move on. So it goes on. And do not be conformed. It says, now we read verse 1. Okay. And do not, this is verse 2. Do not be conformed or pressed into this world. But be transformed or transfigured by the renewing of your mind. That you may prove what is a good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. I just love this. God says, get in the word so you have the right thinking. Because once you have the right thinking, you can respond properly to situations in the earth and prove the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. The word prove, good, acceptable, and perfect is 30, 60, 100 fold. So when you study the word of God and you start acting on it, first of all, it's going to happen is you're going to start to have 30 fold results. There's going to be 60 that still percent, 60% of you still there, but 30% is going to be God. And you're going to like that 30%. You're going to go, well, that's pretty cool. Then you go meet with God. 30, 60, then it come, becomes 100 fold. As long as you walk with God, talk with God, God is changing you from the inside out. Can you say amen? We go to the scripture because our mind fights us on some godly truths. You know, for example, I've told you several truths and I can hear your minds going, that's pretty strange. I don't know if that's right or not. Well, that's normal for you to think that way. But if you get in the script, you'll find it is correct. And you know, once you understand the perspective from God, I don't think you'll have another day of fear in your life. Not one more day of fear. Because you know God's got a handle on this, even though it looks like it's all out of control. Have you noticed? You're pretty cool. You're pretty taken care of. You're not wrapped up. You're not on freaked out or anything like that. Now we've all been. <laughs> you've been peaceful and you've been freaked out. Which one's better? <laughs> Amen. So we walk with God and he begins to give us his ways of looking at things. So we're going to give you a couple of beautiful illustrations here. We're going to talk to you about uh, the talents and the gifts. Okay? So we'll get to that in just a minute. So, get the right mindset. So go with me to Colossians chapter 3, please. Again, some of these scriptures, I use them over and over again, not because I don't know any others. Is because church grows precept upon precept upon precept upon precept. Listen to me carefully. I teach in series. So I teach one step, next step, next step, moving you closer. The way I can get you closer to a relationship and strong relationship with God. Because it's a personal relationship. So as a pastor, my job is to, to build the word up in you if you will embrace it. Okay, God gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry till we all come into the unity of the faith unto a mature man or woman. Right? That's my job, to give you the word and help you to advance. But what happens if we miss a lot of church, then we're missing a lot of steps. You need to go back and listen to it. Why? Because there's certain things that are building in you, whether you know that or not. You're just going to have to trust God. Amen. Can you say amen? All right. So Colossians 3, you look at 1 through 4. Actually, it's 1 through 3. If then you were risen with Christ. How many here born again? Then you're risen with Christ. Where are you? I told you you were on the pew, but you're also in heaven, aren't you? You're a dual citizen. Amen. That means you're a citizen of America, citizen of heaven. Amen. And he says, if you there were raised with Christ, seek or desire those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Folks, I absolutely believe 
that you can be so heavenly minded, you can be wonderfully earthly good. God wants you so filled with the way he thinks about things, you can actually give great advice to those that are seeking him. Hello? So you want to be heavenly minded. You want to think like God. You don't want to become your own God or be filled with yourself. But you want to be filled with God's wisdom because if somebody asks you something, you'll have the answer. Say amen. And he goes on and he says, set your mind on things above. Have a mindset for heavenly things. Get God's mind on everything. Not on things of this earth. For you died. Ye yesterday I was praying. I have these little spots in my yard where I sit down because I get tired of walking sometimes. Or I have to readjust my leg. So I have a seat and I'll sit down there and I'll start praying. And, and God said, son, if you are dead, you know, and he's showing me pictures through the word. And he says, the Bible says I'm crucified with Christ. It says, if you're a dead son, then no matter what anybody does or says, Satan won't be able to get to you because you're dead. You're dead to sin and you're dead to him. So no matter what he suggests, you don't have to act on it. Because you're alive to God not de and dead to him. So if you are dead, have you ever tried to insult somebody in a coffin? Hey, you're looking ugly. Hey, you look like you died a about a week ago. <gasps> you know, come on, let's laugh a little bit. Well, I tell you, you're as ugly as your mama. <laughs> and they're not going to leap out of there and say anything to you. That's what Satan does. He does that. And see, if you've learned to be dead and alive in Christ, then no matter what he says to you, you can laugh. Have you ever known the devil to tell you the truth? So why are we so set to try to lean? Well, maybe that's so. Anyway, not. You need to have a heavenly mindset so you can see how to answer and help people who are on this lost planet with all the rest of us. All right, we'll finish up with these. Go with me to Luke chapter 19. We have been given life. How will we invest it? We have been given life. How will we invest it? First of all, you were born, you were given life from mom and dad and God. And then later on in life, you got reborn. You got accepted Jesus Christ. So you can take either one. Either one will fit. But really, it's the person that God wants to give life to. So let's look at the parable. In verse 11, it says, Now, at, it says, now as they heard these things, he spoke another parable. Because he was near to Jerusalem and because they thought that the kingdom of God would appear immediately. Verse 12. Therefore he said a certain nobleman. He's talking about himself by the way. Went into a far country to receive for himself a what? A kingdom. Didn't you know that Jesus got you a kingdom? Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. So it's a parable about Jesus giving you life. What are you doing with the life God gave you is what this is about. And you can only do what you understand to be what you could do. As a man thinketh in his heart, so he becomes. So if you think you can't, you can't. If you think it's hard, it's hard. If you think it's going to take a long time, it's going to take a long time. Now, I realize there is a little bit of exceptions in that. But you talk to somebody who has all the negative thinking and their life only can go so far and not any further because they've limited their lifestyle. Now, God doesn't want you going out and doing silly things. And serve God is not so you can get another house or a car. It's so that you can walk with God and he can walk you out of this fallen, dead planet. And then you want something? Why would you want to drive a car when you can fly at the speed of uh, thought? You know? 
I had a guy who says, you know, if I'm going to get a car in heaven, I want a diesel. I don't think they'll allow it in heaven. Moving right along. Okay, so let's read this to you, okay? So a certain nobleman went into a media country to get, receive a kingdom. Amen? And then return. Verse 13. So he called ten of his servants. Notice who he called. He called ten servants. Okay? And delivered to them minus. A mina is like a pound. An English pound. Or it's like, let's say, a $10 bill. Let's put that in there. It's a $10 bill. So here's this nobleman. Gives his ten servants each one a ten dollar bill. I'm keeping it small so you can understand it, all right? And then he's going to tell them to do something with it. Remember the ten dollar bill represents your new life in Christ. Everybody gets the same amount. You see, my salvation is the same as your salvation. I, I've been given a ten dollar Salvation, you've been given a ten dollar salvation. It's not the amount, it's the very idea of the unit ten dollars. Okay, the unit ten dollars. So, check this. And he said, He said, and he said to them, He commanded the servants to whom he had given the money to be uh, to go out and do business. So, he called the ten, gave them the minus, and he says. Do business till I come. But the citizens of this nobleman, did they like him? They hated him. So he gave his servants their $10, 10 of them. But the citizens in the, in the country or in the county hated the nobleman. Now remember the nobleman in this case is Jesus. Did the world love Jesus? They yelled, crucify him. We killed the very one that saves us. And you know what? It was the plan of God. I know human, I could hear God saying, I know what they'll do. So Jesus, there's the plan. Boop, 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 boop. They did just exactly what we told them that they would do. Satan is a big, weird dude. And he can't change his nature. He can't be nice to you one time and be bad to you next. Everything he does is to entangle you in bondage. So he goes on and he says, And so it was that when he returned, having received the kingdom, he then commanded these servants, now the servants, not the citizens, to whom he had given the money to be called to him. See, God's going to call you one day and say, What would you do? With the life I gave you. What did you do. With Jesus I gave you. Is the parable. Well I gave him out. I spread him everywhere. Good. Alright. So let's catch it. Okay. And then came the first one saying. Master your pound. Your ten dollars. Has earned another group of ten. We got a hundred bucks here, God. And he said to him, well done, good and faithful servant, because you were faithful. In very little, I have authority, you will have authority over ten cities. Now, if you're faithful with your relationship with God, you're going to rule with Jesus Christ during the millennial reign. If you've been just one of those pew sleepers and never done anything then you're going to be in the back of the line, folks. We don't want you in the back of the line. Can you say amen? We want you on the front pew paying attention. So it goes on. So the first one came, well done, enter into the what? Yeah. All right, so. And then he says, then came the second. Okay. And saying, master, your minor, your $10, has earned another 50 bucks. Likewise, he said to him, you also will be ruler over five cities. Now, who's talking here? Okay. It was one thing if it was just somebody talking, but this is Jesus talking. Okay. 20. Verse 20. Then another came saying, Master, here is your mina. Here's your 10 bucks, which I have kept 
put away in a napkin. For I feared you, because you are an austere man. You collect where you did not sow. And you reap where you did not sow. And he said to him, out of your own mouth, I will judge you, you wicked servant. You knew, or let me say, in your understanding, you had a false understanding of who I was. You thought I was a steer. You thought I reaped where I didn't sow. But I don't break any principles. Because this man had an imagination of God that was not correct. He kept the ten bucks. He didn't do what he was told to do. Many Christians today are keeping your Christianity to yourself. You're not stepping out in adventure land and reaching lives. Listen. If you're a Christian, all you're doing is learning and you're not doing your best to help touch lives, then you're going to get stale if you're not careful. You don't want to get stale. Water gets stale no matter how fresh it is. All right, so he says then, if you knew that all of you had this understanding that I was kind of like this, you should at least put my money in the bank. If you were that afraid of me, you should have just stuck it in the bank and got the interest. No. The guy had more than fear. He was thinking about the ten bucks. And at my coming, I might have collected the interest. Verse 24. And he said to those that stood by, take the ten bucks from him and give it to him who has a hundred bucks. And people will look right there and they'll say, I don't understand that. I don't understand that. If God gave you a position in his son for you to do something and you don't do it, but you just hold on to that, then God will take the gifting that you have and he'll put it into the one that's really busy for God. Hello? God wants us busy enough so that the water doesn't get stale. Can you say amen? So he's saying, as a Christian, don't sit on your Christianity. Invest it to other people. Can you say amen? All right, let's move to the next one. We've been given talents. Some of you can play guitar. Some of you can write. Some of you can draw. Some of you can paint. Some of you can speak. Some of you can do all these different talents. They come through the wisdom of God. These are godly talents. And again, we see another illustration Almost the same thing, but these are talents. So let's look. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling into the far country. We know who that is. Who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. Folks, you were delivered goods. And to one he gave five talents, to another he gave two, to another he gave one. To each according to his own ability. You got talents according to your own ability. So, use them. Don't sit around and say, well, I'm not accomplished yet. Use them. That's how you get accomplished. These are talents. These are not gifts. So these ones have to be hewn. They have to be developed. And if you won't develop them, nobody will. Who are you? What are you saying about yourself? How are you developing with God? How is your relationship going? You should be growing exponentially, daily with the Lord as God is enriching your life. And if you're not getting that, then just tell the devil to bug off in Jesus' name and get it. Can you say amen? Because <laughs> it's for you. Then he goes on and he says, And immediately, according to their ability, immediately he went on a journey. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. And likewise, the one that received the two gained another two. But the one who had received the one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. You see, the wrong concepts, wrong thinking. Did you know that Jesus was healing everybody everywhere he went, right? Except for his own hometown. Jesus went into his own hometown and because the people saw him as Joseph's son, the carpenter boy, they didn't have any faith to receive anything. You come to church and say, oh, i got to go through another church meeting. You won't receive anything. 
You come expecting, you come looking for God, and God will make sure everything lands on you. It's the expectancy for God to be there. I mean, when you sit down to pray, you don't wonder if God's going to show up. <laughs> you get a little sign drops down out of the air and says, Today I'm skipping. <laughs> no. Listen to me. Listen to me. So, and the one that received the one, after a long time, see the Lord's gone a long time, those servants came and settled the accounts with them. And then he said to him, he that received five talents came and brought another five talents. And the Lord said, deliver to me five talents. And look, I've gained another five more besides them. And his Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Who's talking again? Okay, enter into the joy of the Lord. Verse 22. And he also that received the two talents came and said the same thing. I got another two more. The Lord said to him, well done, good faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. I used to say joy of the Lord fellowship. Amen. And in 24, then he who had received the one talent, see, he could have done the same thing, came and said, Lord, I knew that you were a hard man. And the Lord shares with, wants me to share this with you. In the Old Testament, they didn't know a loving God. They knew a harsh God that they better get their acts together. Read it. Only Abraham became a friend to God. And several others because they fellowship with God more often. But in the Old Testament, people have the wrong idea of God. That's why Jesus had to come too. So that we could see that the Father's just like Jesus. Jesus just like the Father. Holy Spirit's just like Jesus. Just like the Father. So we could get an idea that our loving God is not the one causing the problems. And so this is what he said. And he that received the one talent came and says, Lord, I knew that you were a hard man. I'm going to amplify it. Reaping where you don't sow. Have you ever seen God reap where he didn't sow? No. He set up seed time and harvest. So this guy had a polluted idea of God. Do you see it? He was a religious in his thinking. He thought, hey, I know what I'll do. I'll just hold on what God gave me. Because if I go out there and I become a failure, then I don't want God chewing me out. See, they didn't know a loving God. So he says, and you were reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you had not scattered abroad. Verse 25 and finishing. And I was afraid. God doesn't want you to to be afraid of him. He just wants you to respect him. And went and hid your talent in the ground. Look. There you have which is yours. But the Lord answered and said to him. You wicked and lazy servant. You knew that I reap where I did not sow. In other words you understood that this is what I, I am. And gather where I have not scattered abroad. He's not confessing that God is this way. So you ought to have deposited my money in the bankers. And at my coming I would have received back my own. With interest. But because you were. You thought the wrong thoughts of me. Because you think I'm unfair. And you're in fear. You went and held on to it. Now I got what I gave to you. But you realize that God gave us salvation. Just for us. Did he give it just for us? No. He says. Now that you have salvation, you go out into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. I have a couple of birds in my living room that I preach the gospel to. And they sing along. We'll be singing, God, I'm running for your heart. And I go, beep, 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 beep. You know, no, they're tone deaf. But every creature already has a love for God. Did you know that? Every creature has ever been made. It's only us that strayed away with the lies of the deceiver. And so, 
We want to be in the Word so we get God's perspective. You've been given life, eternal life. Spread it around. You've been given supernatural talents. Develop them. You know, singing, praising. How about organization? Can you help out in one way or the other? Develop them. Let God work with you. So that when the Lord calls you into record, you can lay before him the life he gave you and how it's developed. If you got something out of that, we give the Lord a praise.